I want to talk about sugary beverages, sugar sweetened beverages. And it's, it's a hot topic here because we as an organization have decided to eliminate them from the campuses. Exactly. From all of actually our children's sites, not just the hospital, but the clinics as well. We're, I'm super excited about this. This is absolutely positively the right thing to do for kids. And it sets a message for families that um, is really important. For me, I remember even, even to this day, I'm usually only limiting myself to uh, a sugary beverage. I, I shouldn't say this because sugar is seemingly in everything. That's right. Even there stuff you don't sugars, know. sugars, right? Exactly. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll use pop as the example or soda, depending on what part of the country you're in. Uh, I usually only drink it when I'm at a restaurant and it's fountain style. I don't buy pop and have it sitting in my refrigerator. Um, but I think it's something that is automatic to a lot of people. I know that it, it was automatic in my life growing up where yeah, I'll, I'm thirsty, I'll have a Coke, or I'm thirsty, I'll have a Pepsi. And and now we're realizing, well, I guess we've always known and maybe just not cared, but we have we realize now how much sugar is actually in that. Absolutely. You know, so first of all, mad props to you. That's awesome. Um, I personally took out um, pop, because I'm from Minnesota, so pop uh, from my diet about two and a half years ago. So I, I don't drink any, and I can say that it I feel like a different person. Mm-hmm. I've also um, conscientiously set that tone for, for my children as well, so we don't have any in our house that, that they drink regularly. Um, but I do allow them to have it on special occasions, I um, and, and so I, I think that has just been you know, it's part of our culture and so learning or having kids learn to figure and figure out when are things okay and how to put those things in a context of their day-to-day life is also a, a, I think a great idea one thing that sticks out to me with pop too is it's ironic that whenever somebody's thirsty they'll they'll drink a pop that's not a thirst quencher though it really isn't. No, it's so sugary that instead it's going to, and a lot of them have caffeine, but it's go, it acts like a diuretic and it makes you thir- more thirsty and it's going to make you urinate and potentially be more dehydrated. The reason I uh, started cutting down and uh, I, I shouldn't even say cutting down because I, I never really was a mass consumer of soda or pop. The, the only time I would really uh, have it at home is if, if I wasn't feeling well, um, I found like Mountain Dew or Sprite actually would help me feel a little better. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm sure that's not a scientific thing. That's just for me personally. But um, anybody I ever talked to who experienced uh, any kind of weight loss, the first thing they would say more often than not is, oh, I gave up drinking pop. <laughs> Boy, I, that's actually something that I talk about in my patient clinic visits um, pretty regularly is for kids who are overweight or obese, if they remove pop from their diet, realistically, between juices, sugary drinks, and soda or pop, almost 50% of some kids' daily calories are, are from that group. So if you can remove some of that from their diet, it is such it does such a service for their weight, but also they might be better eaters. You know, a lot of families uh, struggle with, my kid doesn't eat anything. W- well, they might not need to if they're getting all of their calories from soda. I mean, if, if they, they won't feel hungry. So removing some of those things from their diet really can make a difference in how they eat and how many calories they're truly getting. With the elimination of, of the sugary beverages here, what kinds of changes do you think we'll see as a result of that removal? Well, I hope there are not a lot of negative changes. You know, I, I think um, certainly in times when kids or families are stressed, they resort to the things that make them feel comfortable. Like when, when you had just mentioned that you were ill, you had wanted a, a little bit of some soda. And so I don't think that is our reason for doing this at all. So I hope there's not a lot of negative um, feedback. But as far as the positive uh, effects that this will that we hope this causes, I think it sets, again, the tone for how to, how to live your life without those sugary um, sodas. And 
I, I don't necessarily anticipate that we're going to see a dramatic d- decrease in the amount of overweight or obese kids in our clinics or in the hospital or in our community. But I, th- I think over time, you know, with our voice and other people's voices, other um, organizations' voices, we will make a difference. People will still be thirsty. What are some good replacements for a pop? The first is water. Oh my gosh. How many kids do we hear? Oh, they just won't drink water. They don't drink water. They don't like water. How can you not like water? You have to like water. I feel bad for anybody who doesn't. And I I even asked the rhetorical question to my wife the other day. Is there a human in existence who doesn't like water? And she said, yeah, probably. In the history of the world, there's probably been somebody who doesn't like water. There are lots of kids who say they don't like water, but it's because they're when you compare it to to pop and you're five, of course you don't like water. You like that pop. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's it really is going to help change that culture as well for us to be thinking of we need we need to, to create a society and a culture that has children love water. There are some easy ways to do it too if kids just don't choose to to drink plain water. You you know I, I talk with families all the time about. You just take some natural fruit, you put a a couple blueberries, a couple raspberries, and some strawberries, and you throw it in, you know, a pitcher of water in the fridge, and it will infuse, and you'll get some of that natural flavoring. That type of sugar, natural sugar, that's okay. Absolutely. That's a great strategy uh, to help people transition into drinking water, especially kids. I, I sometimes will put lemons and limes in my water just for that extra change in flavor. Yeah. And for me, you had said uh, when you when you stopped drinking pop two and a half years ago, you noticed you were feeling better. I feel better when I'm fully hydrated. And that makes a world of difference. A lot of people may not even consider that as a factor in why they may not feel well in a particular moment or in a, on a particular day. And I've found that if I continue, continuously refill my water bottle, whether I'm at work or I'm at home or I'm on the road, I feel better, period, just because everything, it's one of those things you can't really explain. You just feel better. Right. And I think, you know, children can't always describe that and parents can't always recognize what does that mean to feel better. But kids who are well hydrated, first of all, those are kids who uh, get up and move more, right? They've got more energy. First of all, they've got to get up and urinate. And so they're not going to be as sedentary in general. The second is that they're probably less irritable. Um, And maybe that's part of how an adult feels. They just feel better when they're hydrated. They're just less irritable. They've got, you don't have a a dull headache. You rest better, you sleep better. Your body was designed to use water. And one thing I can point to as an improvement when hydrated is a complete absence of a headache. That's, That's one of the biggest differences right so think about how you think better and now project it onto a child who's supposed to be learning and if their whole job in life is to be learning if they're well hydrated they are going to learn better how about uh you'd mentioned the fruit infusion the actual natural fruit infusion what are what are if any some good uh store-bought infusers we see that a lot now where people will have uh flavor changing things that you can pour into your water are any of those good for you i i don't think any of them are truly good for anyone i think if you're going to do an infused water try to do it naturally i mean you're you're taking a natural product you're taking water let's let's try to create um, a society that uses natural product in order to do that. So uh, there's fruits. You could also use vegetables. You can use cucumbers. Oh my gosh, I love cucumber water. And I think kids would too, if you gave it a chance. Uh, So reducing or eliminating pop is one way to cut down on that sugar. Are there other ways to eliminate sugar or reduce it from a child's diet? I think it's really important for... um, parents to to recognize that um, that sugar exists in everything that there's some really good sugars to have those are your natural sugars your, in your fruits and vegetables but the processed foods that we eat um, have a lot of sugar in it too and um, what I was thinking a little bit earlier about how our the 
for adults, how we think about food and our balance for food has shifted for them. And we used to think about this food pyramid where the base of it and the biggest bar was all these grains and complex carbohydrates. That's actually not what we're recommending anymore. We've moved from that food pyramid to my plate, which puts half of your plate being those natural fruits and vegetables and only a quarter of your plate being those complex grains for sugar. So I think for families being really conscientious about um, how much of that processed food that's got sugar in it they're consuming is a critical piece that would help reduce uh, overweight and obese children. What was the catalyst for that change from the traditional food pyramid to my plate? Yeah, I think it was really the USDA recognizing this balance that they've created with a food pyramid is is just not right. It, it just isn't. It has so many complex sugars in it, and it doesn't allow for enough protein to help satiate people. When you talk about processed food, what would, to the layperson, what would be the reason for food being processed and sugar being added in it as opposed to making food and not having as much sugar in it? Is it simply yeah. for flavor? It is. It's it's flavor um, and it's ease. I think you know they. It, in in general, it's probably the cheapest mechanism to make food taste good and reasonable. Is in a process situation to add um, things to it versus, you know, and it versus doing it from an organic standpoint or doing it um, with less sugar. It just doesn't taste as good to the lay population. Um, since there's a non-medical professional on this side of the microphone <laughs> and an expert on the other, uh, I'm going to explain something in a way, and I want you to tell me if I'm in the neighborhood of being somewhat accurate. Uh, when it comes to food in general, if I'm eating something and I know it's not good for me, maybe it's fast food or maybe it's just something loaded with sugar or loaded with salt, my body essentially shuts down and and in a way it's telling me all right we need to stop everything we're doing and work on breaking this down and is that is that what's happening and is that why i don't feel like going out and running or i don't feel like going out and and playing soccer today because my body is concentrating on breaking down whatever i just put in it yeah i mean i think that's in in general true for all foods, whether it's healthy food or whether it's processed food, your body is designed to um, really concentrate on whatever is in the stomach and, and try to break that down and digest it. If it's so-called fast foods, that's foods that are high in fat, um, fat takes a long time to break down. Your body is really, really working on that to process it. If it's um, healthier foods like fruits and vegetables, that's that's a lot easier for your body to break down. And so it can, you know, move that along to your intestines a little bit easier. And so you probably do feel differently based on what you've eaten. You know, if you've consumed, I mean, it's, it's why we, um, we recommend drinking orange juice when, when kids have a, a low glucose because it's absorbed immediately and it's going to give you that sugar high for kids who, for example, are, are diabetic. So s foods are um, absorbed at different rates. Those fruits and vegetables are going to be absorbed much more quickly than something that is highly processed or has a lot of fat in it. I know that with some families, fruits and vegetables are hard to get at due to the prices. They're they're a little more expensive than some other options, maybe some less healthy options. Um, what are some ways around that um, in, in making sure that your children are getting the required fruits and vegetables in, in their diet? Well, I think you just nailed it. I mean, that is, that's the crux of the problem. Not only do, um, you know, we have sodas with high fructose corn syrup that are driving obesity, but also the um, you know, the, the cost of um, buying and feeding your family um, highly processed foods is far cheaper 
than uh, the cost of going to the grocery store more regularly because you're buying fresh fruits and vegetables and then the cost of fresh fruits and fruits and vegetables in general is so much more expensive than uh, highly processed foods and then there's the preparation right the time that it takes to prepare something that's fresh versus something that's in a package that you pop into the microwave and so all of that contributes to to the obesity epidemic as we know it plus access to some of those fresh fruits and vegetables for some parts of the city or some parts of the country is really challenging to obtain so the idea of how do you make it more accessible to families that that's the, that's a key piece right there I know that uh, coming from Duluth, and this this is twofold. One, I miss the water. Lake Superior tap water is wonderful. Oh uh, that's that's probably the biggest uh, family aside. That's the biggest reason why. That's the biggest thing I miss about being here. I, I love living in the, the Minneapolis St. Paul area, but my tap water at home is not very good. Yeah, well, that's probably true. I yeah. I can't speak to it. I don't remember tasting any tap water from uh, the Lake Superior area, that's but now I'm, now I'm going to have to go up there. Next time you're it in out. Duluth, it's, okay. it's second to none. Um, but there's that. When I was living in Duluth working in the newspaper business, I remember we did stories on food deserts where there were some neighborhoods that didn't have a grocery store within walking distance. Oh, my gosh. that I mean, that is... Um, absolutely a key message that we want families to understand but um but there are definitely food deserts in in the twin cities in the state of minnesota and nationwide where access to fresh fruits and vegetables is super hard trying to get to the store in a safe manner um in a safe you know safely without getting getting in harm's way is a challenge too and so i i think that that that's a very real um context that families live in and creates another barrier that uh, is, you know, steps in the way from us getting kids to a healthy diet. For fresh produce or the access to fresh produce due to price is one barrier, but there are other barriers to uh, healthy lifestyles for kids that have little or nothing to do with food. What are some of those? Yeah, I mean, I, I think technology is a huge barrier for kids um, and probably a big barrier for parents too, trying to figure out how to balance technology and allow children to live in this new world with technology, but also make sure that they're getting all the activity and putting their energy into things that are improving their body and their mind too. So I think that's that's another balance that are, uh, contributes to obesity and overweight kids. And I try not to rail on younger generations like the previous generation <laughs> typically does where you'll you'll look at the next generation and say oh well they're they're not the same when as when we were kids or we wouldn't do that but i think about if i was a child who had on demand access to everything i'm not sure i would have spent as much time outside as i did as a kid but we growing up in the 80s and 90s we had to wait for things to come on television you didn't know what song was coming on next uh if you were listening to music and you just you'd go kill your time and spend it uh, outside riding bikes, playing sports. Um, but I I had a, a fun neighborhood of a lot of kids. We had parks nearby, so there were places to go, and I think we were relatively safe. At least I felt safe. I know that kids don't always have that now, and on top of that, they're able to watch whatever they want on demand on their iPad or on their TV. Oh, yeah. I mean, my kids use the word Netflix as a verb. I'm going to Netflix. I, I That certainly wasn't part of my vernacular growing up as a kid. And I, I grew up also where, you know, my parents would open up the back door and they'd say, go outside and we'll see you at dinner. And we just don't live in that type of society anymore where parents feel safe letting their kids just go out not being attended or living in neighborhoods where you could actually guarantee that your children would be safe. So it does create a different type of um, lifestyle that we have to now program in. Adults have to program in time for their children to be active in a safe manner. And I feel like that's something that, whether you like it or not, requires practice routine in a way that if you can if you can get a child to realize how enjoyable it is to go play outside or to uh, do an activity that involves movement 
at an early age, they're more likely to carry that through into adolescence, into adulthood. Yeah. I mean, first of all, it has to be a priority for your family. So you have to, you know, create a culture that it's an expectation. We, we as pediatricians say, we want your child to have one hour of activity every day. But it's families who have to build that into their culture so that it doesn't feel like a punishment. It's the reward. You get to play outside with me for one hour every day if you're little. Um, and if you're bigger, then, yeah, it's, you know, we want you to be active in sports and we're going to be there to support you. And really making sure that it is maintained to be a priority throughout a child's life. You cannot rely on the school system to do this because, you know, the first thing on the chopping block is uh, physical education. And kids are very sedentary if given the opportunity. There are a lot of teenage boys and girls who don't participate in any activities. You know, the school doesn't have the funds or the resources to do it, and families haven't made it a priority. And priority is a must. You look at the physical activity combined with a healthy diet of fruits and vegetables and cutting down on that processed sugar, that will carry over into uh, children sleeping better, um, being more energized when they wake up. And uh, I know that anytime I'm active today, uh, I feel much better in that process leading up to going to sleep. I sleep a lot deeper and then I wake up ready to ready to attack the day as opposed to being in shutdown mode because of you know eating something I know I shouldn't have. Right. No, I think that is absolutely true. People do feel better when their diets are healthier, when their bodies are more active. You know, right now, um, probably one in three kids enter kindergarten, either overweight or obese, which is unbelievable to me. In the next couple decades, we're going to expect that number to be one in two kids. And so this truly is, you know, our opportunity to create a message around how to keep kids active, healthy, and choosing healthier options for themselves, but also parents, because they're the ones setting the stage for this is our expectation of your daily activity, and this is our expectation of the foods that we're going to promote that we buy for, for you to eat and expect you to eat. The medical community always has known what's important to a healthy way to live. When did you realize, either for yourself or as a medical community as a whole, that shift kind of changed where you realized childhood obesity needed to be addressed in a big compared to decades ago? Yeah, now that's a good question. Um, I think it's been kind of insidious, actually. It, um, I guess it's probably been in the last five to seven years that the idea of an epidemic of obesity is really noteworthy. Um, maybe it's Mo Michelle Obama's, um, you know, uh, initiative for for healthy lifestyle for for children, which. Um, capitalized on on some of it as well, but I think it, it's definitely something that we all know, um, and and now I think is really empowering because we're at a time where society also knows. Well, I think a lot of times it's taken for granted, and I know I know I just had assumed every kid lives like I lived as a kid that you you go play sports in the yard and you're riding bikes and and you're you know you're active you're out in the sun, uh, not. Uh, without sunscreen, of course. But <laughs> um, I, I think about now, anything good coming from this, it has to be the appreciation for the physical activity. Um, just the, the enjoyment of it hopefully being enhanced because people realize, oh, this isn't something that was automatic. It's, it's something that does need to be a priority, as we said. But also, I, I benefit from this in so many ways. Yeah, I think... Um it definitely is a different mindset from uh, how I grew up. You know, you were pretty much in charge of your own health as, as a kid, but you had every opportunity to have that. Just go outside and play. There was not necessarily anything um, uh, in, in not intuitive about that. But now we live in a society where really if we don't carve that out for kids – if we don't carve out why things are so important, I fear that it just will go unrecognized. Dr. Gigi Chala, as always, thank you for being a guest. Oh, thanks for having me.